we are in Job. Father, we come before you and we pray that you would open our hearts again to your word. And Lord, that as we study these things in Job, we would be changed. As we understand a man in a time of extreme trial, crying out to God. Perhaps, Lord, we can hear our own voices sometimes in the statements he makes. We don't understand at times what you're doing. But Lord, may we learn to trust who you are. That you are holy, you're righteous, you're faithful, you're true. And you so loved this world that you gave your own son. That you could be just and forgiving sin. And through him be the justifier of them that believe. Let our hearts be open tonight and let your word minister to us where we are with you this evening. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. A little review here, because you have to sort of get back into what was being said as these arguments go back and forth. So we'll go back to chapter 10. We'll just read through it. Uh, just for the record, remember the Holy Spirit here. The Bible accurately records in the book of Job some inaccurate statements by his friends and a few things even by Job. Everybody got that? So faithfully and accurately are recorded, sometimes inaccurate statements made by these advisors. Okay, they're making some assumptions. They've assumed the problem is Job is a sinner. If he would just get right with God, things would change. And so Job had cried out. He said, God is not a man, chapter 9, verse 32, like I am, that I should answer him, that God and I should come together in judgment. Neither is there any daysman. Oh, that there was someone between us that might lay his hand upon us both, one upon God and the other upon man, that he might redeem us, reconcile us is the idea. Oh, let God take his rod away from me. Let not his fear terrify me. Then would I speak and not fear him. But it is not so with me. Chapter 10, remember, he's covered from head to toe in boils. Pain is in every movement he makes. They're filled with pus. He has worms. And he lost his family. My soul is weary of my life. I will leave my complaint upon myself. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. I will say unto God, do not condemn me. Show me wherefore thou contendest with me. Is it good unto thee that, sh that thou should oppress? Is it good unto thee that thou should despise the work of thy hands? Is it good unto thee to shine upon the counsel of the wicked? Hast thou eyes of flesh? Seest thou as a man seeth? Are thy days as the days of a man? Are thy years as a man's days? That thou inquirest after mine iniquity and searchest after my sin? Thou knowest that I am not wicked and that there is none that can deliver out of thy hand. Thine hands have made me and fashioned me together round about, yet thou dost destroy me. Remember, I beseech thee that thou hast made me as the clay and wilt thou bring me into the dust again? Hast thou not poured me out as milk and curled me like cheese? Thou hast clothed me with skin and flesh and fenced me with bones and sinews. Thou hast granted me life and favor, and thy visitation has preserved my spirit. These things thou hast hidden thine heart. I know that this is with thee. If thy sin, then thou markest me, and thou wilt not acquit me from mine iniquity. If I be wicked, woe unto me, and if I be righteous, yet will I not lift up my head. I am full of confusion. I don't get it. Therefore, see thou mine affliction, for it increaseth. Thou huntest me as the fierce lion, and again showest thyself marvelous upon me. Thou renewest thy witness against me, and increaseth thine indignation upon me. Changes and more against me. Chapter 10, verse 18. Wherefore, thou hast thou brought me forth? Why have you brought me out of the womb? Oh, that I had given up the ghost, and no eye had seen me, that I should have been as though I had not been. I should have been carried from the womb to the grave. God help our country. And unfortunately, they're carrying him from the womb to the marketplace to the grave. God help our country. If you're here, ladies, and you've been through the pain of abortion and you've come to Christ, you're forgiven. But God help our country. What happened to us? Are not my days few? Cease then and let me alone, that I may take a comfort a little. Before I go whence I shall not return even to the land of darkness and the shadow of death. Now, he only knows part of the story. 
a land of darkness is darkness itself and is the shadow of death without any order where the light is as darkness. So that was where Job ended. Chapter 11, we pick up. Zophar has been listening to all this. And now Zophar decides to give his first speech and answer to Job. And so, so far, since Elihu, Eliphaz hasn't worked out well, and we had Bildad respond, and apparently that's not reaching Job. So now it's Zophar's turn. Let's see what kind of friend he is. Then answered Zophar the Namathite, and he said, Should not the multitude of words be answered? What is he saying? Wow, do you blabber. Let me translate for you. Should a man full of talk be justified? Lots of words, Job, but no good sense. Should thy lies, what did he just call them? Job, you're lying. You're not righteous. Well, let's see how this works. Should thy lies make men hold their peace? When thou mockest, shall no man take thee or make thee ashamed? <laughs> I'm glad I don't have him as a friend. For thou hast said, okay, Job, here's what you're telling us. My doctrine, my teaching, my, my way of life is pure, and I'm clean in thine eyes. Oh, but oh, that God would speak and open his lips against thee. Hang on a few chapters, he will. And that he will show thee the secrets of wisdom. Stay tuned, he will. And that they are double to that which is. There's more, you know, I'll, I'll go there. What, the, what little we think we know of God, I think we're going to be absolutely astounded when we see him. We're only seeing part of it, right? The secret things belong to the Lord, but the things he's made known to us belong to us and our children. Deuteronomy, I think, 29, 29. I think that's where it is. If not, you can chill me later. I think that's a ballpark. It's double to that which is. Know, therefore, Job, that God exacteth of thee less than thine iniquity deserves. The guy's covered in boils. He's lost all of his kids. Everything he owns has been taken from him. His wife, in what seems to be pity, says, why don't you just curse God and finish this? Why don't you just toast yourself, in a sense? Curse God and come under judgment. Curse God and die. And what he says to him is, you're getting less than you deserve, Job. Wow. That's a number you keep by your phone when you're struggling. Well, that does bring up a good question. What do we deserve? Turn to Romans 3, right turn. Romans chapter 3. What do we deserve? What is man standing and women standing before God? Interesting. Paul writing to us, to the Romans, verse 9, chapter 3, Romans says, What then? Are we Jews better than they Gentiles? No, in no wise. For we have proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth, Romans 3.11. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. He goes on, verse 18. Here's the problem. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Therefore... By the deeds of the law, verse 20, shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. What is it? Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Wait a minute. What did he say? Oh, that there was a daysman betwixt us that might lay hold of God. And might lay hold of me, as he said. And now, by faith of Jesus Christ, upon all that, what does it say? Believe. Who does that exclude? Does it say upon all those who have a certain ethnic background? Upon all those who can solve quadratic equations? Upon all those who've made pilgrimage for three miles on their knees backwards? Does that what it says? It says upon all those that... Believe. Well, what if you refuse to believe? Then what do you get? You get the result of your disbelief. You get his judgment. Notice no one is excluded. The only way someone can be excluded is if in the hardness of their own heart, they exclude themselves from God's offer of salvation through Christ. Whether you're Jew or Gentile, you need a redeemer. You cannot save yourself. 
That's what he was showing through Romans. What do we deserve? Verse 23, all have sinned. All come short of the glory of God. Look at the difference. But being justified, justified, <laughs> Mr. Wabbit, being justified freely by his grace, how? Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. What do you mean? Christ Jesus, whom God set forth to be a propitiation, the sacrifice he'll accept, through faith in his blood, which was shed to fulfill the law, to declare his righteousness, which when we believe, guess what? We receive. To declare his righteousness, for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness that God might be just and also be the justifier of him which believes in Jesus. Wow. So what do we deserve? I'll tell you. Look at Romans 6. The wages of sin is death. And how many have sinned? All have sinned whether Jew or Gentile, all fall short of the glory of God. And the wages of sin is death, but the verse doesn't end there. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And how exactly do you receive that gift? You must believe. And no one is excluded except those who exclude themselves. Wow. Okay, back to our text. Know, therefore, that God exacts of you less than your iniquity deserves. It's true, but it sure isn't exactly what he needed to hear right now. It's harsh, but it's true. Canst thou, by searching, find out God? Canst thou find out the Almighty under perfection? Now, that's Zophar's question. Can you answer it? Canst thou by searching find out God? What's the answer? Turn to Jeremiah 29. See, this is where your quiet time helps you to be able to analyze the things that are said and go, hmm, do I buy Zophar's argument or do I see something different from Scripture? Remember, the Holy Spirit is accurately recording some of their inaccurate statements. Look at Jeremiah 29. Israel is the southern kingdom in rebellion. Things are going down the tubes. They're being told they're going to be deported to Babylon 70 years. Lots of things are coming because of their unfaithfulness. And yet in 2911, God says this, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil. To give you an expected end. Then shall you call upon me and you shall go and pray unto me and I will hearken unto you and you shall seek me and you shall find me when? When you search for me with all your heart. And what is it we have to do to be saved? Believe upon what? Upon the sacrifice he sent, the Lord Jesus Christ, God in human flesh. Who is excluded? Only those who refuse to believe. When you seek me, you will find me. When you search for me with all of your heart, and I will be found of you, saith the Lord. Nice. Back to our chapter. So Zophar goes on. Canst thou by searching out find God? Canst thou find out the Almighty under perfection? Thankfully his answer is short. It is high as heaven. What canst thou do? Job 11.8. It's deeper than hell. What canst thou know? The measure thereof is longer than the earth and broader than the sea. It can't be measured, at least in their minds. If he cut off and shut up or gathered together, then who can hinder him? For he knoweth worthless or vain men, Job. Well, where is he trying to go with that? For he seeth wickedness, wickedness also, Job. Where is he trying to go with that? Will he not then consider it? For vain or worthless men would be wise, though a man be born like a wild ass's colt. Uh, what analogy is he making? You're a dumb animal, Job. <laughs> so nice for him to visit. <laughs> if thou prepare thine heart and stretch out thy hands towards him, if iniquity be in thy hand, what is he assuming? You're getting less than you deserve, and what you're getting is because of your sin. 
Same theme. If iniquity be in thy hand, put it far away. Let not wickedness dwell in thy tabernacles. In other words, why don't you repent, Job, and things will change. For then shalt thou lift up thy face without spot. Hold the phone. What's he covered in? Boils. Boils. What would that leave? Blotches everywhere. He's essentially mocking his condition. Then shalt thou lift up thy face without spot there, spotty. Yea, thou shalt be steadfast, as right now you're falling apart, and thou shalt not fear. Because thou shalt forget thy misery, and remember it as waters that pass away. Everything will get fixed. Thine age shall be clearer than the noonday. Thou shalt shine forth, thou shalt be as the morning. If potential and promise, the sun's rising. Thou shalt be secure, which he's not right now, because there is hope. Yea, thou shalt dig about thee, and thou shalt take thy rest in safety. And thou shalt lie down, and none shall make thee afraid. Why is he bringing this up? What did we learn last week? Oh, it's Wednesday night, and we're tired enough, and we just were happy to show up to church, and I was asking questions, and it's old English, and we don't really follow <laughs> Why is he bringing this up? What did we learn last week about Job's sleep? He was tormented. Look, for the record, go back to chapter 7 for a minute. Look at chapter 7. Remember what he said. He said, when I say, verse 13, my bed shall comfort me. Oh, thank goodness, it's nighttime. My couch shall ease my complaint. Then thou scarest me with dreams. Now he thinks it's coming from God, but who do we know is behind this? Satan's activity. You scare me with dreams. Thou terrifiest me through visions, so that my soul chooses strangling and death rather than my life. Here in the demonic realm, somehow, whether through dreams or even visions of something, the guy's getting terrorized. So now Zophar says, look, if you just repent and get things right, you finally can have a real night's sleep. You won't be troubled like this anymore. Wait a second. What psalm does this remind you of? You got it for me, Dusty? Go to Psalm 22. 23 is very close. Psalm 22. Take a look at Psalm 22. There's a statement here in Psalm 22 that we sort of look at and go, hmm, wonder what that's about. Maybe we have a hint. Psalm 22. It starts out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Who does it tell you of? Jesus crying on the cross. Why are you so far from helping me? From the words of my roaring, O oh my God, I cry in daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent. But thou art holy, O thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and they were delivered. They trusted in thee, were not confounded. But I am a worm, and no man, a reproach of men, despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, they literally quoted this, mocking Jesus when he was on the cross, not knowing what they were saying. They shake the head saying, he trusteth on the Lord. David, he would deliver him, Matthew 27, 43, you can see it. He trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him now, seeing he delighteth in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. There is none to help. Many bulls have come past me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They have gaped upon me with their mouths as a raving and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water. All my bones feel like they're out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bones. My strength is dried up like a potsherd. My tongue dehydration cleaveth to, the, to my jaws. Thou hast brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. Who does this tell us? They've pierced my hands and my feet. Who is it? It's Jesus. Listen what else happens. I may tell all my bones. They look, they stare upon me. They part my garments among them and they cast lots upon my vesture. Who's this? It's Jesus. Okay, Pastor, but you were talking about dreams and everything. How does this tie in? Glad you asked. Go back a few verses. Many bulls have compassed me. Uh, what bulls were around him at the crucifixion? Bulls. 
Bulls have horns. Strong bulls of Bashan, heavy occult area, beset me round about. Whatever these things are, they gape upon me with their mouths like a raving and a roaring lion. Many feel what we're getting here from the psalmist is what was happening in the demonic realm around him on the cross. Job is terrorized in dreams and visions as he's under Satan's assault. So we know Satan's M.O. when he comes under attack or when he attacks someone is to challenge even with horrific dreams and visions to ups, unsettle them, to trouble them. And so here we have this psalm that clearly details the crucifixion of our Lord. And here it talks about there's something going on that is troubling, that gapes upon, that's like an attacking lion that is overwhelming. And yet, no one seems to see it. When we get to heaven, we'll find out for sure, but it may well be. Job gives us a hint of some of the strategy in Psalm 22. You see, he not only bore our sins, by his stripes were healed. They pierced his hands and his feet. But he also had to deal with the demonic realm. What a wonderful Savior. And when we receive Christ, when we believe, that simple, simple opportunity to any man, woman, or child, even a small child can understand. Andrew understands what it means to believe. He's four. And not only will God forgive your sin, but God will keep you from the lake of fire that was prepared for the devil and his angels. What a wonderful Savior. But back to Zophar running at the mouth. Well, then verse 19, you will lie down, Job, none shall make you afraid, which you appear to be complaining of. Yea, many shall make thy, their suit unto thee, looking for your help. But the eyes of the wicked shall fail. The idea is to weep or to be overwhelmed. And of course, clearly Job had to be mourning. They shall not escape. And Job looks like he's trapped, doesn't he? No way out. And their hope shall be as the giving up of the ghost. What has Job been saying he's ready to do? Give up the ghost. Well, thank you so much, Zophar. Let's see what Job has to say. And Job answered and said, No doubt, but you are the people, and wisdom clearly will die with you. Let me translate. Well, aren't you a genius? <laughs> he's being facetious. This is a total slam. And look, the guy is in pain. Everything, he can't move without pain. His heart is broken. His wife's not the most encouraging in some of this. And he's getting dumped on by his friends. So he's just like, I, you, I can't take this. You guys think you're geniuses. No doubt you're the people. Wisdom will die with you. Verse 3. But I have understanding as well as you. He, give the guy a break, all right? He's... <laughs> I have understanding as well as you. I'm not inferior to you. Yea, who knoweth not such things as these? Duh! Oh, King James says it more eloquently. I am one as one mocked of his neighbor. You people are sitting here charging me with wickedness, but if you had paid attention to me as a neighbor, you would know that I've tried to live a righteous life. What are you saying? He's defending himself. He's kind of had it. And by the way, we're only in round one. We got two more rounds to go. I'm as one mocked of his neighbor who calleth upon God and he answereth him. The just upright man is laughed to scorn. Get it? He that is ready to slip I'm, I'm with his feet. I'm like, I'm finished. Is as a lamp despised in the thought of him that is at ease. You ever go out at night with kids and give them a flashlight? <laughs> Anybody? You know, and we've been, we go to Camp Sandy Cove almost every year, and I bring little flashlights. And can you please tell me, when you hand a small child a flashlight, and you're trying to get outside and, you know, and get your eyes adjusted and all that, where do they shine them? Right in your face. Have you noticed that? Like, Dad, is it working? Like, ah! You know, am I the only one? Or is this inherent genetic from the fall? Is this? All right, good. Thank you. I feel better. I keep it, point it down, the point in your eyes, you're ruining your night vision, can't see the stars. Well, that's what he's saying. I'm like one whose feet is ready to slip, and you treat me like I'm an annoying light in your eyes. I'm like a lamp despised in the thought of him that's at ease. It's easy for you guys to sit here without boils, without losing everything, with all your stuff intact, to trash me. You don't know what I'm going through. 
I'm uh, interpreting for you. The tabernacles of robbers prospered. Wait a second. Let's review the record here. Robbers seem to live just fine. They don't seem to have these problems. They that provoke God seem to be secure. For example, Larry Flint, Hugh Hefner, and others. Oh, it looks like they're having a great time. But a day of judgment will come. They that provoke God seem to be secure. Into whose hand God bringeth abundantly. They, they, things go their way. They have stuff. But ask now the beasts, and they shall teach thee. Guys, you call me, have, you say I have less sense than a wild ass's cult. Let me tell you something. Go talk to the animals. They've got a better theology with God than you clowns. It's basically what he's saying. Even the animals know this. Thanks a lot for your encouragement. Ask now the beasts. They'll teach you. The fowls of the air, they shall tell you. Speak to the earth. The ground will answer you for crying out loud. It shall teach thee. The fishes of the sea shall declare unto thee. Everybody gets it but you guys. Who knoweth not all these things? Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this? In whose hand is the soul of every living thing? Wait a minute. Who would that include this evening? Go like this. <laughs> you and me. Every living soul is in his hand. Boy, the patience of God. Knowing what's going on around the world... And yet he allows them to continue, those who do such horrific things right now in Syria and in parts of even Jordan and in Iraq and elsewhere where people are being slaughtered wholesale. People who love him are being slaughtered wholesale. Man, the patience of God. And we wonder, Lord, where are you? Oh, he's going to bring that day. Even the animals understand this in whose hand is the soul of every living thing. This is a chilling thought. And the breath of all mankind. Now that's true. I agree with that. And you know, it's funny. You weren't thinking about breathing the entire day until we just mentioned it. Now you're like, isn't that funny? All night long you sleep, trusting that your cerebral cortex will do its job to keep you breathing. It's funny how uppity we can get in front of God and forget that without the next breath, we're done. What does that remind you of? Turn to Daniel chapter 5, right turn. Daniel chapter 5. We've heard this elsewhere. Belshazzar, grandson, we believe, of Nebuchadnezzar, is having himself a little soiree. While he's doing it, they grab the vessels from the temple that Nebuchadnezzar had captured when he just destroyed and he sacked Jerusalem. And so they had these goblets and they were praising the God of gold and silver and stone and other things. And suddenly on the wall, part of a hand appeared and wrote, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Euphorsa. None of the wise men there could interpret. Queen Mother apparently comes in and says, listen, buddy, you need Daniel stood before your grandfather, and she says your father, but the idea is grandfather, you're in the lineage of. And they call Daniel in. And Daniel gives him a little lesson than they forgot about. Verse 18, Daniel 5. Thou king most high, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar thy father, really grandfather, a kingdom, majesty, glory, and honor. And the majesty that he gave him, all people, nations, languages trembled and feared before him. Whom he slew, he would. Whom he kept alive, he would. Whom he would set up, whom he would put down, he would. But when his heart was lifted up and his mind was hardened in pride, and he would, which was the same problem Belshazzar, I mean, he was deposed from his kingly throne and took his glory, they took his glory from him. He was driven from the sons of men. His heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild asses, and they fed him with grass like oxen. His body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men. Don't panic. No matter how inept Washington may be, God's in control. No matter which branch of government can't figure out what are its boundaries and the limits thereof, God is in control. Was down at Independence Hall today, took the little tour, got to listen about how the branches of government are supposed to check and balance each other. God's still in control. 
till he knew that the Most High God ruled in the kingdom of men and that he appoints over it whomsoever he will. Verse 22, Daniel 5. And thou, his son, O Belshazzar, has not humbled thine heart, that thou, even though you knew all these things, but you have lifted up yourself against the Lord of heaven, and you have brought the vessels of his house before you. You and your lords and your wives and your half-wife concubine have drunk wine in them, and you have praised the gods of silver, gold, brass, iron, wood, and stone, which see not, hear not, nor know. And the God in whose hand your breath is, you're holding his cup in your hand, he's holding your breath in his hand, checkmate. And all whose ways you've not glorified. That is why the part of the hand was sent from him. And this is the writing thereof. And this is the writing that was, oh, wrong verse. And this is the writing that was written. Mene, mene, tekel you farson. This is the interpretation. Mene, God has numbered thy kingdom and finished it. You're done. Tekel, you are weighed in the balances and you are found wanting. Ooh. Back to that, you need to believe. If you refuse to believe, you're going to be judged before God. And guess what? You're going to be found wanting. Wanting what? Wanting a Savior that you rejected. And there your knee will confess, there your knee will bow, your tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord, but now it's to your condemnation because you have been found wanting through your own rejection of him. Yikes. Perez, thy kingdom is divided, it is given to the Medes and the Persians. And as this was pronounced, Cyrus and his armies, having diverted the Euphrates, were going under the water gates. The bars that came down to protect it, found, came in, found the stairs going up. The gates, as prophesied by Isaiah, were left unlocked. And that night, Belshazzar was killed in almost a bloodless takeover of Babylon. Okay, back to our text. Our breath is in his hand. And so is our soul. Back to Job 12. In whose hand is the soul of every living thing, verse 10, the breath of all mankind. Doth not the ear try words and the mouth taste his meat? Can I listen and figure out what you're saying? With the ancient is wisdom, most often, sometimes not. And in length of days, understanding, yet it's interesting how some people get quite old and yet seem to have no common sense. You know, common sense is not common. Have you learned that? With him is wisdom and strength. He hath counsel and understanding. Behold, he breaketh down, and it cannot be built again. He shutteth up a man, and there can be no opening. He's basically quoting Revelation 3, open and shut doors, and Isaiah 22. Behold, he withholdeth the waters, and they dry up. Also he sendeth them out, and they overturn the earth. Ultimate example, the flood. With him is strength and wisdom. The deceived and the deceiver are his. He's over them. He leadeth counselors away spoiled. He maketh the judges fools. Ha! Huh, I had the same problem back then. Sorry, I digress. He looseth the bond of kings. He girdeth their loins with a girdle. He brings them down. He builds them up. He leadeth princes away spoiled, and he overthroweth the mighty. Again, parallelism in the Hebrew poetry, he's giving the idea. God brings up, God takes down. He removeth away the speech of the trusty, taketh away the understanding of the aged. He poureth contempt upon princes and weaketh the strength of the mighty. He brings up, he takes down. He discovereth deep things out of darkness and bringeth out to light the shadow of death. He exposes everything, whether good or evil plots and schemes. He increaseth the nations and destroyeth them. Here's Hebrew poetry again in parallelism. He enlargeth the nations and straighteneth them again. Same thing. He taketh away the heart of the chief of the people of the earth. Remember Rahab? Remember she hides the spies? Joshua 2, right? 2, yeah. And there in verse 9 she says, listen, We've heard what your God did to the Egyptians. We heard what happened with the crossing there, the Red Sea. We heard and saw what happened with Og, Sihon, the kings of Bashan. We've seen these things. And now, we, because we know your God has given this land into your hands, therefore the hearts of our kings are trembling. It's exactly what was being said here. He takes away the heart of the chief of the people of the earth. He causes them to wander in a wilderness where there is no way. They grope in the dark without light, and he maketh them to stagger like a drunken man. Nebuchadnezzar would fall under that. Lo, my eye hath seen all this. 
Mine ear hath heard and understood it. I don't need you guys to help me understand some of God's ways. What you know, the same also I. Wait a second, this sounds kind of arrogant. Hold on. He's covered in boils. They're rattling on like an old radio station that you don't want. And he's trying to say, come on, really? What you know, the same I know also. I am not inferior unto you. In fact, how would you guys be doing if you were in my shoes? It's another thought, but I add that. Surely I would speak to the Almighty, and I desire to reason with God. In other words, I want to argue my case before God. Wait a minute, how many have sinned? The wages of sin is? Do you want to argue with God? I'd rather just accept his plea bargain of mercy. <laughs> If I confess I'm a sinner and I believe in his son, I have received not only mercy, but grace. I'll take that bargain. I'll gladly confess my crime. I'm a sinner, guilty, guilty as charge, all the accounts, past, present, and sadly, even future, though I should know better. I'm guilty. But I thank you, you provided the way for the judge to be just in forgiving my sin. And the very one who forgave my sin is also the justifier of me who believes in his son. I'll take that deal. Surely I would speak to the Almighty. I desire to reason with God. But you are forgers of lies. You're calling me wicked. You're calling me corrupt. You're calling me getting what I deserve. You're forgers of lies. You're slandering my character. You're all physicians of no value. Nothing worse than that, huh? Oh, that you would altogether hold your peace. That's a nice way of saying. Thank you. And it should be to your wisdom. If you would just shut up, you'd look smarter. Proverbs says a few things about that. I think it's in 17, 28. Hear now my reasoning and hearken to the pleadings of my lips. Will you speak wickedly for God? You charge me with wrongdoing and I haven't done it. Will you speak wickedly for God? Will you talk deceitfully for him? Will you accept his person? Will you contend for God? Why don't you let God do it? It is good. That he should, is it good that he should search you out? Or as one man mocketh another, so do ye mock him? He will surely reprove you. Hang on, he will. He will surely reprove you if you do secretly accept persons. Shall not his excellency make you afraid and his dread fall upon you? What does Job have? A reverence for God. Now he's getting into trouble where he starts asking, what are my sins? But he still has a reverence for God. How would you fare at this trial? Okay, then. Me neither. Your remembrances are like unto ashes, your bodies to bodies of clay. Hold your peace. Here's that poetry again showing up. Be quiet. Let me alone, that I may speak, and let come on me what I will. You know what? I can't take it anymore. I got to say it. Wherefore do I take my flesh in my teeth and put my life in my hand? All right, I'll tell you what I'm thinking, and I'll take whatever music I have to face. But note this, though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. So I'm going to say what I got to say, but I trust him, even if he kills me. What is that in the midst of a deep valley? Faith. I love Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And I've become very familiar with it because Caleb has loved that story forever. And we basically had to tape the center of that part of the Bible together because he's worn it out looking at it. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, listen, King, you can, you can play your extended dance three mix tune all you want. We're not bowing. It's not happening. You're going to heat the furnace seven times hotter. All right. But know this. Whether we come out of that fire or not, our God is able to deliver us. And we're not bowing your statue. And by the way, if they called in all the governors, satraps, provinces, and everything else, all the leaders, sheriffs, etc., there's a good chance, we'll have to find out in heaven, there's a good chance Zedekiah may actually be there and he's bowing, the acting king in Judah at that time. But we've got to wait till heaven. Our God is able to deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we're going to be delivered one way or the other. We're going to be with him. We're not bowing to that thing faith. Though he slay me, yet I will trust in him. But I will maintain my own ways before him. I'm not going to sit here and listen to you guys trash me. I'll make my own defense. 
He also shall be my salvation. Wow, in the middle of this low point, still looking to God. Faith. For a hypocrite shall not come before him. What did Jesus say? Many will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, and he'll say, I never knew you. Hear diligently my speech and my declaration with your ears. In other words, pay attention. Behold now, I have ordered my cause. I know that I shall be justified. Job continues to maintain his righteousness. How are they going to take that based on what they've been saying? We're just not reaching this guy. That'll be round two when they decide to reach deeper. I have ordered my case. I know that I shall be justified. Who is he that will plead with me? For now, if I hold my tongue, uh, it's going to kill me. I shall give up the ghost. I have to say it, come what may. Only do not two things unto me. Then will I not hide myself from thee. He's speaking ultimately to God here. Withdraw your hand far from me. Stop beating me and terrorizing me. Is it God who's doing it? No. See, Job doesn't know. Withdraw thy hand far from me. Let not thy dread make me afraid. Then call thou, and I will answer. I'm ready to defend myself. Or let me speak, and answer thou me. Uh, does God owe us an answer? May he give us an answer? Sometimes he may, but does he owe us one? No. What does it mean to be sovereign? It means he's in charge. Ooh, I don't like that. Wait a second. Do you know the heart of the king? Do you know the nature of the ultimate judge of the earth? If you understand his heart and his ways, and they're beautifully demonstrated to us through his son, then you don't have to be afraid of him. We should fear him with respect and all, but we have no need to be afraid. Even the children are comfortable approaching him because of the love of God. Hmm. If I hold my tongue, I'm going to pop. Withdraw your hand from me. Let not your dread fall upon me. Then call, verse 22, and I will answer. Or let me speak and answer thou me. Now here's where we get in trouble. How many are my iniquities and sins? What is he demanding? God to justify what's happening. How many are my iniquities and sins? Is this fair? Make me to know my transgression and my sin. What did I do is the idea. Wherefore hidest thou thy face? Why don't you come on out and tell me? And holdest me for thine enemy? What have I done to you? Will thou break a leaf driven to and fro? Parallelism. Will thou pursue the dry stubble? I'm nothing. Why are you doing this? For thou writest bitter things against me. The idea is you have made indictments and allegations against me that are false. Now here's where we're getting in trouble. He's demanding of God. He doesn't know the whole picture. He's in pain. He's got worms, boils, and lousy friends. Give him some grief. Give him some comfort. Not grief. He's got enough grief. You write his bitter things against me. And thou makest me to possess the iniquities of my youth. How many of you have them? How many of you lied to grandma when you stole that candy out of her dish? How many of you lied when you spilled the milk because you had a sibling there? How many of you lied when that window got broken on the garage saying it was the neighbor kid that hit the puck? You know you're all guilty. How many of you lied saying you didn't brush that Barbie doll's hair and now it's... <laughs> oh, I knew that half of the game too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You make me to possess the iniquities of my youth. Thou puttest my feet also to the wood is the idea we understand stocks. You've punished me without trial. Wait a second. He's demanding again of God. Thou lookest narrowly upon all my paths. Thou settest a print upon my heels and my feet. Apparently he's marked in a sense. And he is a rotten thing consumeth. as a garment that is moth-eaten. Man that is born of a woman is of few days. They are so short. And full of trouble. Life's not fair. When did life become not fair? <coughs> When Adam exercised his ability to choose, which God gave him, and God knew which way he would go. But like this trial, God didn't cause it, but he had to know. He's omniscient. And it's been said, I love what Don McClure said years ago at a Valentine's dinner. 
People who asked Adam, wasn't it great that innocent love, wasn't it great when everything was perfect, wasn't it great when the animals were in harmony in a sense and the creation of God was in order, and wasn't it great to know that kind of innocent love? And Adam, Don quoted Adam saying, in a sense, oh no, I've learned something better, redemptive love. Man cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He fleeth also as a shadow and continueth not. It goes so fast. And dost thou open thine eyes upon such a one and bringest me into judgment with thee? Again, who am I? I'm like a leaf. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Wait a minute. Let's read that again. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Who? Okay, we got mm, ah, sheep are murmuring. Give me something, give me an example where a clean thing has been brought forth out of an unclean. What sin did Jesus have? None. Did Mary have sin? Ooh, now this may divide some of the room, especially with the visit coming. Well, did she have sin? <gasps> How can you say that? Defend it. We already went through it tonight. All have sinned. Who does that include? Mary. Well, wait a minute. Well, then why doesn't that include Jesus? Ah, glad you asked. Let's go look at Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. By the way, Isaiah gave us a prophecy. Behold, a virgin shall be with child. She shall bring forth a son. We will call him Emmanuel, right? Okay. Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Behold, now Matthew writing... The angel speaking to Joseph in a dream, Joseph, fear not to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She'll bring forth a son, she'll call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Jesus, Jehoshua, Jehovah Shua is the idea, God is salvation, translated Jesus to Greek. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, shall bring forth a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted, God with us. Go now to Luke chapter 1. You know, you know when Zechariah is told that he and his wife Elizabeth, though they're old, are going to have a son, and should call his name John? And Zacharias, bold, mighty man, son of Abijah, priest of God, in for his rotation, said, How can this be? And the answer was, I'm the angel Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God. For that, you're not talking until he's born. And is that what happened? We see the account. Then he comes to a virgin in Nazareth, espoused to a man Joseph, says, fear not, Mary, you have found favor with God. You're going to conceive a son. And she said, how can this thing be? Seeing I know not a man. I'm unmarried. I'm a virgin. I'm glad she asked that question. Because look at the answer that she gets. She doesn't get rebuked. She's asking an honest question. Wait a second, but I'm not married. How can this be? Here are the priests. Anyway, Mary said, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that what? Holy thing. That holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And what is his name? Jesus. He is Emmanuel, which is? God with us. Now, listen, this is important. Why is a virgin birth essential to our salvation? Because if Jesus, no thanks to some of the attack jobs that have been tried to be done through novels and whatever, if Jesus is born of two earthly parents, then he is born a sinner like you or like me. Why? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But if he is born by the power of the Holy Spirit, placing in her womb the Son of God, then he is born of a virgin, 
He is born by the divine work of God. He is God himself with us, and God has no sin. He has to be born of a virgin, because that way he has no sin himself. He is God in human flesh. Born of two earthly parents, he is a sinner, and therefore cannot pay for any of us. That's why the virgin birth is essential to our faith. And interestingly enough, Isaiah makes it very clear. It is a sign of Messiah. A virgin shall be with child. But, but I heard that could be translated young maiden. Really? Well, the word used when they translated that Hebrew to Greek in 200 B.C. 200, let me slow down, B.C. Before what? Before the Son of God came. When they translated it into the Greek, the Jews, who should know Hebrew, used a very specific word for virgin. It's a virgin will be with child. God will place in her womb the Son of God. God himself will take our sins. He will have no sin of his own. And Jesus put it on record in John chapter 8. When they're going back and forth and bantering, he finally says, which of you can convince me of sin? Let me translate. Name my sins. They had none. That's why he had to be tested in the wilderness. Adam failed in paradise. He passed in the wilderness. He was tested even in the garden of Gethsemane. Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. What did Adam do? His will. And what did it do to this earth? Dragged it all into condemnation. So back to our question that we had from Job. As soon as I find it. Here we go. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? Now Job's question is accurately recorded. But God's own son came forth of a virgin with no sin. God, here it is again, 2 Corinthians 5.21, in case you're not sure. God made him who knew no sin to become sin, that we might become the righteousness of God through him. He took our place. And by the way, what do you have to do to be forgiven? Believe. Wow. Okay. Well, he goes on, seeing man's days are determined. Wait a minute. Let's read that slowly. Seeing his days are determined. The number of his months are with thee. If God knows everything, does he? Yes. He says he does. That's called omniscience in theology. Omniscient, to know all things. Okay, so if he's omniscient, does he know how long we have? Yes. Do we know? No. There's the difference. Plan as though you have 100 years, live as though you have tonight. Seeing the number of his months are with thee, thou hast appointed his bounds that he cannot pass. God has his timing. Turn from him that he may rest till he shall accomplish as a hireling his day. In other words, leave him alone, let him run his course. For there is hope of a tree. If a tree be cut down, he's not an environmentalist, I'm just letting you know, he's, he's not hugging him. But there's hope of a tree. If a tree be cut down, that it will sprout again that the tender branch thereof will not cease, though the root thereof wax old in the earth, and the stock thereof die in the ground, yet through the scent of water, and in the desert there, this is different. You get a little rain, it all blooms. Through the scent of water, it will bud. It'll be back. It'll bring forth boughs like a plant. In contrast, but man dieth and wasteth away. Yea, man giveth up the ghost, and where is he? As the waters fail from the sea, and the flood decayeth and dryeth up, so man lieth down and riseth not, till the heavens be no more. Wait a second. He's more accurate here than he knows. And I saw a great white throne, and he that sat upon the throne, from whose face heaven and earth fled away, and the sea gave up the dead that were in them. Death and Hades, or Sheol, that heart of the earth holding chamber, gave up the dead that were in them. I saw the books were opened, and I saw the dead judged before God. Revelation 20. And anyone not found in the book of life, how do they get in? They believe. Was cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. One prepared for the devil and his angels. Man lieth down and riseth not till the heavens be no more. Interesting, he, he actually got that one. They shall not awake, nor be raised out of their sleep. Is there another option? I show you a mystery. will not all sleep, but will all be changed. There is the first resurrection. We've studied it before in Corinthians, and you want to be part of it if you believe. He goes on. He knows things. We know things he doesn't. We know more of the picture. 
He said, Oh, that thou wouldst hidest me in the grave, that thou wouldst keep me secret till thy wrath be past, that thou wouldst appoint me a set time and remember me. If a man die, shall he live again? Answer, yes. Does he know this? We have further revelation. If a man die, shall he live again? Yes, if you believe, everlasting life. If you reject God, shame and contempt. Shall a man, if he die, live again? All the days of my appointed time will I wait till my change come. Thou shalt call, and I will answer thee. And thou will have a desire to the work of thine hands. In other words, hopefully to speak to Job, speak to what he's made. For now thou numberest my step. Dost now thou watch over my sin? My transgression is sealed up in a bag, and thou sowest up my iniquity. I'm trapped. And surely the mountain falling cometh to naught, and the rock is removed out of his place. The water wears the stones, and thou washest away the things which grow out of the dust of the earth, and thou destroyest the hope of man. Thou prevailest forever against him. He passeth, and thou changest his countenance, and sendest him away. His sons come to honor. And he knoweth it not. Why? He's dead. They are brought low, but he perceiveth not of them. But his flesh upon him shall have pain, and his soul within him shall mourn. Do you get a sense he's having a tough day? Well, we come now to round two. Give you something to think about for the next week. Eliphaz answered and said, Should a wise man utter worthless knowledge? How do you think it's going to go? God willing, we'll find out next week. Let's stand. Let's pray. Remember, with each round, off come the boxing gloves, then off comes the wrap, and then bang, here come the knuckles. So, Father, we come before you and we pray, Lord, these things that they only understood dimly through a glass, thank you that we have greater revelation. God would bring forth his own Son, that holy thing which is conceived in you is of the Holy Spirit. You will bring forth a son, you will call his name Jesus, and he will save his people from their sins. Lord, thank you, you have given us the grace to believe that the daysman who is between us has come. He's laid hold of you and your righteousness. He's laid hold of us and our sins, and in bearing our sins, he bore your wrath and your righteousness. So through faith, we could be forgiven. Lord, thank you that our slate is clean before you. Thank you that we are washed in the blood of the Lamb and we receive by faith his righteousness. Thank you, Lord, to all who believe we have eternal life now. The rest are the details. Be with us this week, Lord, and strengthen our hearts. And again, I pray for anyone that they're in this valley with Job. May they be encouraged you have a purpose, you've not forgotten them, and you will bring forth your blessing in your timing. You are faithful. Thank you, Lord. Go with us this evening. In Jesus' name, amen.